The company that really is data driven is going to understand that data is a constant exercise. I'm always going to be instrumenting data. It's not a one time project. Maybe people are almost trying too hard to be data driven that they put this huge weight on themselves, a huge burden on their engineers to say, track everything. I want to know what everything that's happening. Hi, and welcome to the June podcast. I'm your host, Enzo, co-founder at June. In this show, I'm talking to the most inspiring product and growth leaders out there. We'll share their tips on how to launch and grow your SaaS. No fuss, no BS. I hope you enjoyed the show. So hi, Crystal, and welcome to the show. How are things? Hello, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me on. Excited to have you here. So a little bit about yourself. You are a product and growth practitioner with a lot of experience leading some of the fastest growing companies in Asia. You were the senior VP of growth and data at Gojek. Is it the, the right way to pronounce it? Yes. That's right. That's correct. An end-demand multi-service platform. During your five-year tenure there, you helped them grow from 30K orders a day to more than 5 million orders a day. So a lot of people are not familiar with this company, but it's it's absolutely massive. It's more food deliveries. Huge. Uh-huh. huge in Southeast Asia, primarily in Indonesia, Singapore, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and so on. So yeah. It, we were doing more food deliveries than Uber Eats, Grubhub, Postmates combined for a bit uh, outside of China. Um, so yeah, it's a massive business. Massive business that brought you uh, massive learnings, uh, which we're yes. going to talk about in, in, in a second. Beside that, you do a lot of other stuff. I had to pick up, I pick up three things. You an entrepreneur in residence at Reforge. You've written some of my favorite content on analytics, which uh, brought me to, you know, to reach out and uh, and this discussion we have today, especially you have an article called Why Most Analytics Efforts Fail, which again, we're going to talk about in a sec. And you co-authored the Data for Product Managers course and the Product Analytics course on Reforge, which makes you even more legitimate to talk about today. And last but not least, you're an active angel investor and you're the co-founder of Generation Girl, a nonprofit focused on increasing the STEM access for young women in Indonesia. That's right. Again, welcome. And to, to, get, to get started, I wanted to, you know, before we get into the nitty gritty details of data, I wanted to contextualize things a little bit and answer one simple question. Why is data useful or not? So, you know, everyone talks about being data driven. The world is supposed to be data driven. When is data needed in your experience? When, when does intuition is enough, you know? So, I think many people think of data in a very narrow lens when they they ask these questions around, how do I be more data driven? The fact of the matter is data can be used to inform better decision making. And so when you think about and reflect on how you do decision making, you often are pulling from many different types of data and data should be considered not just the quantitative pieces, but also the qualitative sides. Qualitative being what you hear from customers, what you are feeling intuitively. Intuition and how you are feeling is actually, in my opinion, a form of evidence. And evidence is just data. Data can be comprised of many different types of evidence, whether that is what you've heard from customers or how you are feeling. And so for people to say, well, I want to be data driven, but I don't believe in just being data led, or I don't just believe in quantitative data leading all of my direction and decision making, that's fair. I don't think that we should narrowly be making decisions just based on quantitative data that we can collect. Uh, But it's also in the same lens, kind of silly to say, I'm only going to use one type of data, which is just my intuition. Your intuition should round out all of the other forms of data that you can collect, dependent on how severe or Uh, important your decision making needs to be. And so if you are making a decision that will affect an entire company or an entire marketing budget, you should certainly use more data versus a decision that decides, you know, what are you going to eat for breakfast? Just isolated to you, you have many shots at what you eat for breakfast, you can probably use more intuition based on you know that type of decision making framework. So I think it really depends on what is the severity and level of I guess, impact a decision is going to have and therefore layer on top as many different types of evidence or data as you can, including intuition, but ideally also 
evidence that comes from a data set in a table. Right. So thanks for differentiating the qualitative and quantitative. I think that's going to help for the rest of the discussion. And it sounds like it comes with a trade-off when you speak about it, right? Like how critical is the decision? What's the trade-off? Like what's the cost of leveraging data? There's always a cost, right? Looking for data, analyzing data, that is a sunk cost. And so the trade-off is the search time. The search time required to look for information that is relevant, to sanity check that that information is correct, to corroborate that information with other data sets that support that information, or ideally looking for evidence against that data point that you have found. And so the more time that you spend on collecting data and analyzing it, the better informed and better impact your decision must be to make up for that sunk cost. And so I always say that search for data is a negative utility. The more time you spend on it, the more time you've wasted, and therefore the payoff should be greater. So there are natural stopping points, I think, like optimal stopping points to saying, okay, I've done my search and I've done what I can. That is relatively feasible to do for now, given the extent of the importance of my decision that I'm making. And I should just make a decision now because part of the goals that we have in doing data analysis is to not spend our entire lives searching for data and making the optimal decision. So it does bear to reason that the trade-off needs to be understood first. When you are making a decision, being able to say, well, here's how important knowing this information is and to what extent if the data were perfect, how much incremental impact I will have knowing this information. And if I take X amount of time to run this analysis, I should stop because anything longer than that is not a good use of my time. That's, I have so many follow-up questions on this one. How, how do you, like, so, so you, you talk about the potential pitfall and the risk. Is there any moment where basically running this analysis at the same cost is a right decision to do? Like, is there some scenarios where you've seen where people should do it? So generally I find if it is a mission critical decision, foundational data point, if there is, let's say, a heuristic that the company is operating on that they believe, for example, in, in Gojek, if we believe that drivers inherently can only do transportation orders, that is a pretty narrowly defined opportunity space for a driver fleet in Gojek, where we have taxi drivers, motorcycle drivers who, at that current moment, were able to pick up packages and deliver them to other users. And in fact, in Indonesia, the time that we started the business, most people did have that belief. They believed that a motorcycle taxi driver could be trusted with delivering packages, but definitely not, you know, their children to school, definitely not food, definitely not grocery shopping or anything more sophisticated than that. And so in wanting to counter that belief, that heuristic that everybody had, that did require mm an amount of search, both qualitatively and quantitatively, to be able to say that this baseline hypothesis that we have probably isn't true. Because what our users believe limits the potential of the business. And so it's worth that sunk cost time to see if that hypothesis can be countered because the potential upside of that hypothesis being wrong is tremendous. And so when we looked into the data, we would call uh, customers and drivers who are using the service more frequently. And we found that people were actually already using it for food delivery. So that data point already started to counter the heuristic that was already kind of a fundamental truth almost. So I think the more strongly people believe a heuristic and the more that a business is built on top of that assumption, the more critical it might be the sanity check, whether or not that hypothesis or that heuristic has changed, whether or not there is more evidence to counter this and to drive that business growth forward. That resonates a lot. I've seen a lot in my career, some new business units being opened. And oftentimes, one of the, one of the first thing that the person in charge of the business unit does is running this very complex analysis to kind of convince the company that the, you know, the direction that is being taken uh, is meaningful, especially if it's multi-years investment. Yeah. I mean, if you are building a 
baseline new business model, if you are, you know, trying to invest in a, in a year's worth of engineering resources and marketing dollars, a pretty significant amount of analysis should go in to be able to validate and justify the spend and the resource distribution. 100%. So this is when things are a bit ticked up. What about when they're just super smooth, when things work perfectly? Do you have an example of an organization where, you know, the analytics initiative were just perfectly, you know, aligned with the business objective and there was no, you know, troubles, basically? I think this is hard. You only really know this kind of reverse engineering the data and looking backwards. And so we don't know the cases where a business didn't do its analytics correctly and and never won. And we don't know if it's because they didn't do the analytics correctly or not. Um, but there are certainly businesses that I think have gotten things right. YouTube is probably a great rec- uh, recommendation engine that's very analytics driven. They also have an advertising business where they need to know what each user is interested in. They need to be able to use that data to generate the right inventory for their ads with the right targeting. So all of these businesses with noise that need to sift through lots of content or lots of categories or inventory. Netflix, Spotify, Google, Facebook, these are all good examples where if they are able to get their data correct in both terms of their population analytics, their user analytics, as well as their economics analytics, these types of businesses require strong analytics initiatives because you would need some kind of qualitative rendering of what a target demographic would be, whether that's, you know, a population of millennials or women or people interested in e-commerce products, but cheaper e-commerce products. These are all kind of qualitative definitions that need to be modeled into a quantitative model. And then you have, of course, low margin, high efficiency businesses. Gojek is one of these, wherein we need to match make drivers with the right rides. We need to understand and and forecast supply and demand economics. Anything that requires logistics like this, like Amazon would be a high efficiency business that needs to have their analytics tightly aligned with business objectives because if that business is not efficient, it's not going to grow. So I think it really depends on the businesses that have goals that as I need to understand my customers well enough for my business to do well, or I need to understand the efficiency economics of my business for my business to grow. These are the businesses that require the best analytical initiatives. And 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 when you spoke about these businesses, something that came into my mind is that it, it feels like almost like a good analytics practice is preventing these companies from building clunky products. Like when you think about YouTube and so much of the sophistication comes from the backend and the engine, this helped them a lot to keep the, you know, the interface dead simple, right? So it's almost like it's, you know, helping out the roadmap in a way. Have you, have you ever reflected on this one? Do you have a, any, any, yeah, framework maybe? I think my take on this is the better your analytics efforts and the better you know your customers, the less decisions they have to make, right? A lot of our recommendation products are centered around how do we surface the most relevant item or recommendation to the user? such that our filter and search features are less used almost. And the better the product is at serving the user without the user having to ask for it, the better the product is. And the product then has to make a bunch of assumptions based on this data that they collect about the user and what they've historically seen in the past for users like them to be able to almost promote those recommendations so that a user is not forced to find it on their own. I think that can simplify not necessarily the roadmap, but certainly the UX. Like if you look at Airbnb, the amount of reviews that you provide, the types of internal personal decisions that you are making when you book a hotel or an Airbnb, there are a lot of factors. But a lot of these factors aren't actually available as filters on the UI for Airbnb. My assumption is, they figured out a way to surface the relevant homes and listings based on their own quantitative models don't require a user to necessarily have to create those search filters and queries for for them. Fascinating. Wow. There is a lot to be said about uh, 
the like the connection between yeah the data and and kind of the products you're building maybe maybe for another another day um there there is something about time also and and perspective of time right trying to meet some short short term objective versus long term objective so you mentioned the algorithm you mentioned gojek how do you also think about you know the you know the balance between immediate success and long lasting you know strategy impact can, can the numbers help with that or qu again quantitative and qualitative data a proponent of finding appropriate proxies so if i'm given an analytics question like how many users have restaurant within 10 minutes of them when they're ordering go food and how do we know whether or not we should be promoting these 10 minute away restaurants on go food listings or not That's a fairly elaborate analytical question that mm -hmm. could span hours or days. Or you could think of maybe more appropriate proxies. So I might take instead a snapshot of user sessions at lunch, maybe a hundred of them. And maybe I would pull the top, the first 20 restaurants, uh, that were in their listing page and see what percentage of them are within 10 minutes. There are a lot of these like curiosity questions, what I would call like entertainment value questions that CEOs will ask. And I think it's important to then ask that follow up question of, are you going to make a new decision on this? What is the meaningful change that we will make? Or is this just something as an FYI to learn? And in these cases, if it's going to take me 30 seconds to run the proxy query or run the proxy analytics, I'll probably do the analysis, even if it's just an entertainment question. But if it's going to take hours, I will certainly ask, you know, what are the, what's the net impact of this answer? Let's say that the answer is yes. What will we do? Right. In the best case scenario, if you find that your hypothesis is a hundred percent true, heavily weighted and biased towards you being correct, what are the new feature changes or user experiences that this would unlock? or that you would now prioritize and how much of a difference to the business would this decision make? So this is almost like a third order question, not just what, what, what can you do about this data knowing it's true, but also what happens to our users and our business if that hypothesis is true. I think making that simultaneous uh, leap thinking wise is the mark of a very good product analyst because they're able to suss out one, is this a meaningful question that will change the decisions that we make? And two, if that decision is made, is there actually a difference that our business will see um, or that our customers will see? And if dependent on these two answers, I think then you can benchmark or sandbox the amount of time spent on an analytics project. That makes a lot of sense. And this brings us back to the intuition piece from the beginning. Um, like if you need to ask this question, it needs to come from the, you know, the input from a human, I guess. Right. So I'd love to. So is this the way it's always meant to be? I had a question at the end, which was about AI and how AI can help us shape a bit the world of data and analytics. Do you think this input is going to be also are going to remain the future? of how, you know, people find insight or, or, or like for my hypothesis, do you think this needs to evolve or is this the role of human in this whole schema? I think the role of humans right now needs to be goal setting, right? And so if you think about what is the optimizing metric that I am goaling on, oftentimes it's going to be revenue, but it could also be things like number of orders. It could be a great user experience. It could be time spent on the platform. And so defining that goal then helps create new goals. And we've seen lots of examples of AI you know, kind of taking that goal and almost distorting it in a way that's cheating, right? If you have an AI that's supposed to win this game and it finds like a hack to do it, but it kind of defies all the other rules that we didn't actually want it to break. And so the human experience in product analytics, when you are defining analyses, is actually goal setting to start with. 
And then it's finding some evidence and then editing your goal post hoc. So a good example of this would be when we first started out, we were collecting driver ping data. And that location data for hundreds of thousands of drivers, every 15 seconds, that's a lot of data to collect. And mm -hmm. this was in an era where collecting this amount of data was perhaps not the easiest thing. Um, and so we had to make a decision. Our goal is to be better at supply and demand matchmaking. You would think that driver locations is a great data point to add to this algorithm. But we realized that our goal had to be adjusted slightly instead of just, I want to create better supply and demand matchmaking based on the location of a driver. We also had to add in the sub goal of, but I don't want to spend millions of dollars collecting this data in real time with robust infrastructure that perhaps isn't worth our investment right now. And so that goal gets adjusted as you collect more information, you learn about the state of the data, the goal then becomes shifted. And I think great analysts are great at updating their goals in a way that AI perhaps is not. I think AI can perhaps help with goal prompting, but the fine decision making, if you are someone working on a product with a specific vision, you need to make decisions that are dependent on information that's perhaps not available to the AI, such as the cost of cloud infrastructure or the amount of engineers that you have available to you or the amount of funding and the time that you have to maximize your product's uh, kind of objectives and show investors that you're doing well. AI may not have all of these context clues. And as humans, the great thing is that we almost... Uh, I guess, blend that data, those information points into our intuition, which is why when we make these decisions, we're like, oh, this doesn't seem like the right way to go, but we may not be able to articulate it. And I think that's what makes us powerful against AI for now. For now, yes. So it's more like you foresee AI more as a way to enhance the human than really actually a way to replace some of the... I mean, probably... AI can already or will very soon replace a lot of the b basic, you know, uh, analyst work. I think where AI really shines is a common fallacy or mistake that I see product managers making or even analysts making is appropriate search for possible solutions. And so you may have some goal, you run some analysis, and because that analysis turns out positive, let's say you find that, you know, 60% of drivers in Jakarta complete all of their orders and there's this 40% driver base that isn't. And your goal is then to, your decision is then to, you know, turn off their apps because they're bringing down your driver acceptance rates. Now, an appropriate search for other possibilities could be, well, let's analyze, are these drivers on a handset device that is perhaps slower to accept orders. And maybe there's a bug or an issue that prevents them from being as high performing as this other driver base, the other 60%. Is there perhaps a problem with traffic that certain drivers, that 40% of drivers are uh, disproportionately affected by traffic or poor allocation uh, experiences? And so I think it's more of AI, AI's possibility could be perhaps suggesting this wider search for possibilities, whereas analysts tend to look for one piece of evidence that strongly corroborates with one hypothesis. And then we say, this is the best, this hypothesis is supporting, um, is supported by this evidence. And we just go with that answer, even though there's probably a million other things that we could be analyzing. And all of that is, again, a time sink, but perhaps AI can run some of those analyses up front and suggest potential solutions or other potential answers to this problem in a way that's more efficient. I see a lot of platforms like June doing this, um, where it's kind of floating to the top. Here are some other pieces of ev evidence that you may not have considered, or that may point to another direction for the solution that might answer your problem statement better than the one that you've analyzed. Yeah, that's, I think there are like two worlds when it comes to data. One is like the streamline world where, you know, you have one hypothesis, one piece of answer and one decision. And then you have yep. this multi-dimension space that you just mentioned where there's just so many things that can influence, uh, you know, a consequence in, in the product, in your data. 
And then you're looking into this whole correlation, causation situation, and it's just, it's just very hard to, to do any arbitrage decision there, to be honest. That's right. I mean, sometimes you have this hypothesis. A good hypothesis will answer that original question. It solves that problem. It can be tested by gathering additional evidence. So you're able to do more analysis that supports it and that it's consistent with the evidence that you already collected that supports it. But sometimes we also do analysis in the hope that it will suggest a hypothesis. It will help us imagine or almost reveal weird things happening in the data that then points us to a hypothesis that we can come up with. And I generally call these fan theories. So if you see something weird in the data, how do you explain that? What is a fan theory that you can come up with that you can then do additional analyses on to make it a real hypothesis? And then you can run an experiment on that as well. And I think this active thinking is important for any analyst because you're coming across all these uh, data sets every day, related or unrelated to maybe the business objective at hand, but you should kind of try to internalize these as what's normal in the data. You know that there are these strange upticks and downticks or strange behaviors from certain populations or certain cities. And that's all information that when internalized can help speed up the and improve the actual hypothesis making for another problem statement later on. Yeah. And I guess the process here is what to look for the outliers or like just to dive and dive and dive into data points and data points and, and, exactly. and follow your, your intuition again. <laughs> yeah. And intuition can be built up um, through seeing lots of different analyses, lots of different data sets, lots of different benchmarks like that adds to your intuition. It should inform your intuition of what's normal. And when you find something that's out of normal, that should be a signal to you to look further. 100%. So, so you touched on, on benchmark. I really wanted to touch on this one too. So there is your benchmark, right? Yeah. Uh, is that country or this vehicle or this kind of food above or lower my benchmark, which, you know, speaks for itself. And then there is benchmark in general. Like is my app activation better or less good than the industry benchmark? Is there such a thing? Does it exist like an industry benchmark? Is it part of the job um, that you do maybe or that data people should do, you know, to talk with their companies, to talk with investors, trying to understand the benchmark? I think benchmarks are important in terms of evidence. And I think they provide two things when used well. Benchmarks provide one, directionality. Are you above or below the benchmark of this industry standard? The second thing is it hopefully provides a weight of that directionality. How much should I weigh this piece of evidence given its specificity and my scale? Specificity being if it's just here is the overall benchmark for sign up activation from landing on the page to filling out a sign up form, let's say it's 60%. This is for what industries? Is it everybody? Is it SaaS? Is it B2C? Is it in Latin America? Is it in America? And so knowing the specificity of it will generally weight this less if it's less specific. And knowing my user base, this submetric of scale, if my user base is very reflective of that industry benchmarks uh, demographic pro profile, then I can say that they should be corroborated. But if I'm a brand new startup, and I've got 100 users signing up, and they're mostly in the US, and they're mostly developers, I can hardly say that that benchmark should be weighted perfectly with my current metric. And that I should pay it some attention, but certainly not 100% of my attention. There should be some kind of understanding intuitively of how relevant that benchmark is to your own database. And so I generally use benchmarks as a way to signal just how out of whack am I from the industry standpoint. And I generally care more about wild swings um, on either side. If it's much lower or much higher, it tells me something. It either tells me that my if it's if my current activation benchmark is 60% and my actual activation rate is closer to 90%. Most likely, my activation rate is only going to go down because I'm already at 90%. Industry benchmarks at 60%. 
what might be helpful is perhaps understanding why my current activation rate is so high and what's working and for what target markets. And if I can continue to expand on that target market, but it should be in the back of my head that it's likely that this activation rate will go down. And if it does go down, this isn't something to worry about because it's still over the industry benchmark. I think that's how I would use it more as a weight of consideration, knowing that the current scale I have and the type of population I have. Very interesting. Yeah. And so it's more a balance. I, we had uh, last week, uh, Casey Winters on the podcast, mm. and he was saying that uh, he also felt that, um, you know, at the end of the day, it was a balance of multiple metrics you have in your product and how, you know, any kind of mix could basically work uh, for you, depending on, you know, like, for instance, talking about activation, if the monetization was good, it could offset a poor activation or things like that. Yeah. And these metrics don't exist in isolation, right? So if we're just comparing industry benchmarks, we have to understand where is that data coming from? How relevant is it? How much should I weight my own understanding of it with my own internal data, knowing the complex inter intertwined mechanics of my own internal benchmarks? Mm, that's maybe not easy. It's And that's kind of why I, how I explain looking at metrics and industry benchmarks is thinking of your own internal company metrics or data set is almost a fog of war where you have a bunch of interesting data points uh, and things that you know about your own product. There's also data points that you know about the enemy or the industry uh, on the other side of the map. And you're trying to uncover as much as possible with as much clarity as possible. But it's impossible to know everything about the current point in time snapshot that you have today. And so given that that is impossible, at least for humans, maybe not for AI. We need to pick our battles on what to focus on, what to uncover more analytics or more insights for, because we can't possibly boil the entire map, so to speak. 100%. And now that you have more experience into, let's say, a couple of industries like food delivery, um, do you feel you've changed a little bit the way you approach benchmark? Like, do you feel like you have a stronger sense of the benchmark and this helps maybe people you advise or people you work with, or do you always challenge yourself, you know, and just try to get the baseline data point and hypothesis like you were doing in the early days, maybe of your, your career? That's a good question. Actually, I realize now that the way I use benchmarks is to reasons to not do more analysis, actually. And so if I know a benchmark and we're either close to benchmark or above it, I won't do more analysis there because unless I have evidence to suggest that that product area is not doing well. So for mm -hmm. example, if I'm running an activation analysis and I see that my activation rate is, let's say, 90% and the industry benchmark is 60%, then I'm probably not going to start my analysis or deep dive work on activation because we're already over the industry standard. Mm. Now, however, if I do find out in doing some other unrelated analysis that the SMS delivery rate of this random small provider is not working as it should, and that might answer why our activation rate is 90% instead of 92%, then I will use that additional evidence against that industry benchmark and say, okay, well, maybe there is something here. If it takes me 30 seconds to query to validate it, then that might be a bug to fix and to add to the pipeline. But I won't do green field, blue ocean analysis on activation metrics if I know I'm significantly above industry standards. So I actually use industry benchmarks more as a way to not do analysis rather than to do analysis. Because just because I know my benchmark or my metric is below industry benchmarks doesn't actually tell me why or where to look. I need more data to figure out a hypothesis to do a deep dive. And so if I know that the industry benchmark for conversion rates on e-commerce is 2% and my conversion rate is only 1%, and the question is why? I don't know. Where do I start? I have to do more analysis to even find a hypothesis. So just because I know there is a problem does not mean I know where the problem is or how to find it. And so I think the best appropriate way to use 
industry benchmarks as a one shot answer is more of a where to not analyze. Where not to go. Yeah. So this looks good. Move yeah. on. And, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I think what I heard is also that the, the data points is probably like the, 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 the what, but the why is always something else. Another question. Yes. The why requires like five more iterations. Yeah. hundred percent. If you find it right. Cause you st- sometimes even have some, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you don't. It's true. Sometimes you don't. Yeah. Or sometimes you just have finger in the air hypothesis. I love That's to right. dive. I'd love to dive a little bit further. So we talk about the org level a lot. One of the course you wrote is about data in product management. And I'm, I'm really, really fascinated about this one. Um, it would take a lot to cover everything you, you're covering, but I'd like maybe to touch on what is one of the uh, misconceptions that PMs have when they attend your course and what is one of the things you need to deconstruct maybe when you get started? So I think a lot of PMs first, they think SQL is hard, SQL. And I think it's less hard than they think. But second, I think they also underestimate how precise it has to be. And so if you were telling someone how to construct a peanut butter sandwich and you told them that a robot has to be programmed to do this, you would be surprised at the level of specificity you require. For example, you need to tell them to put two slices of bread on the plate instead of put bread on the plate. You would need to tell them, take one tablespoon of peanut butter after you open the jar versus put peanut butter on the bread. Mm-hmm. And I think the level of specificity and seeing a SQL query made people realize, got people to realizing that there is a level of nuance to data points and that data can often be, mm, say, massaged. And data, massage the data to make it reveal almost any truth that you want. If you segment enough, if you narrow the time windows enough, if you change the conversion windows enough, you can get your data to tell you almost anything. Mm-hmm. And I think having people realize that, how not to be wrong, is more important and more feasible than how to identify an aha moment. And so what I try to teach is more of a how to not be wrong with your data. How do you cover all your bases in terms of applying the right filters, looking at the right data set, using the right nomenclature and avoiding syntax failures um, of like null values or if data doesn't exist versus analyzing it and finding some magical aha moment answer. Because we often will not find a data point that says, if only the product did this, had this filter, had this UX page, then 100% of our users will convert. Like that does not exist. None of our problems are simple. And that's why PMs have the job that they have because it's very hard, requires intuition, it requires prioritization. And so what I tried to teach in the course is let's pull data correctly. Don't be wrong. Use the right filters, syntax, time windows, and then relatively prioritize your hypotheses using formulas like odds ratios, or correlation analysis, things that can be single use tools that you apply to different data points in a uniform way, which means that you can compare them in a relative way. And that relative comparison tells you things like the problem size as is 0.39 odds ratio of likelihood to convert to a confirmed order, and it applies to a target market size of 10,000 people versus this other um, user behavior, such as clicking on the terms and conditions page, which has a huge likelihood of converting users to a booking confirmed, but actually only five people ever go to this page at any point in time. So you're able to kind of make these very objective comparisons on a relative basis to one another that at least prevents you from picking problems that don't have any real weight or Mm -hmm. sizable merit. Because I often find that people run an experiment or they pull some data, like number of users going to the terms and conditions page. You find great statistical significance that's actually not meaningfully significant. Those Mm -hmm. two are not the same thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that your product will do any better. And I think reframing problems and opportunities as 
events that users perform in your database that happen before your goal of an order being confirmed or some engagement metric or retention metric allows you to at least compare all of these user behaviors in a stack rank order. And then you still have to make that judgment call of what is the right experience to create to encourage this behavior or fix this bug. And that's the thing that the PM has to think about and work on. And that's the thing that AI is probably less likely to do. That's very interesting. And so j just to wrap up on the PM, one thing that you cover really well in your course is the uh, the altitude. So meaning like the, the topics where basically the PM should be uh, owner and efficient versus delegate or yes. have someone supporting. Um, just a TLDR here. Um, what's, what should the PM do versus not do? So SQL, PM should learn SQL uh, here. And uh, what do you think they should ask, you know, a supervisor or a data team to do versus they should do themselves? Exactly. So in terms of altitude maps and where a PM should focus on, they need to know if their hypotheses directly correlate to the metrics that they care about or that their boss cares about. It's very common for a PM to inherit some roadmap or set of metrics. And they only focus on those metrics, which is fine, but you may find that this is a local maximum. If you know to look one up and look at what your manager cares about, and you can see that there are some gaps, perhaps no other PM is working on that you feel are better, um, have better opportunities, that should be something that you can discuss with your manager. But in many other cases, the biggest mistake I see is a PM will do some analysis or do some feature work that doesn't actually answer the original set of metrics that they inherited. It's covering some, someone else's metric or it's just, it's good. It's like, it'll help the user experience or it'll help revenue in some way. But if they are tasked with improve the use, the percentage of users who use the search bar and make a completed order, they start looking at other things like, oh, what happens if someone clicks on a category card and they uh, get a recommendation? Like that's not actually within the realm of space that you are tasked to operate on. And that's why I mentioned that a good hypothesis is one that answers that original question. If it's answering some other random question, it's maybe a good hypothesis for something else, but not for this specific question on the altitude map. Very, very clear. I, I love the framework. I, I, I hope I knew it when I was PMing. <laughs> uh, would have saved a lot of time. Um, I'd love to wrap up with one topic that I don't think you wrote too much about, but you told me you have some thoughts, which is analytics in startups. So uh, we talk about a lot of concepts, which are, I think, um, very applicable to a later stage, because as you grow, it becomes this exponential problem. Yeah. But what, what about that startups? Like maybe when you advise and so on, wh what do you think people should get started with? What is, what is the, what is the mistake maybe that startups make the most often? And what is the way they should do it instead? So the biggest who, I don't know if I can stack rank these because they're all really big mistakes, but let me pick a few. So mistake number one, you do not confirm that your conversion event or conversion data tracking is correct. So you only know when half of the users, you know, completed a sign up form or started to pay and you don't know 100% of that information or it's split between different payment method uh, platforms. And so the data is in two different places. So that's mistake number one, put all of the event data for a conversion in one place or the mistake is not doing that. Second mistake that I often see is this huge focus on the starting funnel on connecting people who, or connecting events on you know, the first landing page, attribution, marketing spend, that's great, but in a way that is unconnectable to the conversion event. So this is mistake number two, is not being able to tie the start of the funnel with the end of the funnel. And when you create marketing attribution campaigns and you know how much you spent on every channel, but you don't know how well each channel is converting, that's a huge problem because now you know the spend and you know that conversions have gone up, but you don't know why. That's mistake number two. And I think the third mistake is believing that you have to do all of your events all at once in a linear fashion. So when I ask a startup whether or not they have any data and they'll say, oh no, like we don't have time for this project. Like 
we'll we'll start on it later when we're at you know x thousand users and i think that's a mistake because you can track as little or as much as you want and you don't have to necessarily go in order so i generally think of it like almost like rock climbing where you have certain anchor points that you want to put into the mountain but you don't necessarily need to just go up the mountain linearly um and so i would suggest that you track your conversion events at 100%, track some first impression event at 100%, and then actually go into the middle. It's almost like a sorting algorithm where you go to the middle and you pick some kind of midway event that you think a user should perform that gets them halfway to your conversion event, track that really well. And then maybe back step left or right, depending on how informative that is and see if one of these other kind of directions work, but I wouldn't linearly go step one, step two, step three. I might go steps 50 and step one, and then step 25, and then step 17, step 25, right? I would kind of hedge my bets and try to get closer to a space where I will get more information uh, once I figure out where the problem statement is. And so a lot of people do like this whole like working backwards thing. I think it's fine. Um, if you know your user conversion rates really well, but a lot of startups in the early days are kind of spending a bunch of money on attribution and marketing. And so I generally like to do this kind of splitting halfway points pivot methodology. I don't know. I need a name for it. Maybe we can create a name for this. <laughs> I read it as a coarse grain first. So you start coarse grain. So you have yeah. maybe have one event on step one, one event on step uh, 10. Yeah. And if the conversion is good, you don't need any anything else. Exactly. <laughs> and if it's not good, then you go fine grain. Exactly. You, I, I love this one. So why 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 is that? I mean, I, what you just said, like I heard it a thousand times. Why are startups not starting small with their data plan? I think many companies want to just do the data tracking once. And I don't know if this is like an idealism, like a belief that I just have to like get it over with, like rip a bandaid off. But the companies that think this way are not actually data driven, right? A data driven company knows that they have to do instrumentation every time they release a new feature because otherwise they don't know what's actually going on in their product. And so the company that really is data driven is going to understand that data is a constant exercise. I'm always going to be instrumenting data. It's not a one time project. And maybe people are almost trying too hard to be data driven that they put this huge weight on themselves, a huge burden on their engineers to say, track everything. I want to know what everything that's happening. It's very counterproductive though, because then you get an event log that's just filled with events. You don't know what really matters. Um, and they're not at a level of specificity or uh, cleanliness because you stuffed 50 events in one sprint versus maybe four events in one sprint. And so anyone listening to this, if you have no event tracking, think of four events that you could instrument. If you had to instrument in one sprint, four events, what would they be? And I would literally just start there. Could there be something about actionability or I don't know how you call that, but in your, in your article, Analytics Mistakes, you, you mentioned that people sometimes measure things for the sake of measuring them versus the actions. Yep. Could it be that uh, there's a bit of a bottleneck after the, you know, after the track, the tracking is in place into the analysis phase or people just don't see the value maybe enough? I think it's because in the past when we were doing things like e-commerce, like e-commerce has the most sophisticated tracking. We have Google Analytics that has kind of built this robust, very opinionated, inflexible taxonomy for tracking e-commerce events. But in today's day and age where our products are specifically nuanced and they create experiences for a very varied group of people who don't just need to convert once and then disappear, we care a lot more about behaviors. And that's why I split out my event tracking into understanding types of events. There's an intent event, a success event, and a failure event. And intent is the hardest one for a lot of companies to grasp because what we tend to think of as event tracking is I see the number of people or events that did this behavior 
And that's it. I don't figure out why. But what we're actually doing is we're looking at the number of people who did this event, and then we're splitting them into how did they get here and which ones became successful versus failed. Um, and how do we segment based on some behavior? For example, credit card type. How many people came in here with a specific type of credit card or PayPal or cash option? How many of them ended up as successful? And being able to think of event tracking not as isolated moments in time, but as reflections of almost like destination paths. Like you actually care about the thing that came before it. Uh, what behaviors did each user type have before they got to the success event or failure event? I think that's what many people don't have is that reframing of event tracking isn't about calculating how many people did what thing. It's calculating what types of people made it to this event and why? And when you ask yourself this question, you track events very differently. Mm, okay. And this is relevant also for startups, I assume. It is. Especially for startups. Um, we're, we're, we're reaching the end. Um, maybe just to wrap up on, on this topic, the, the qualitative data. Is, is it more important maybe in the early days than the qualitative, uh, the quantitative one? What's, cause we talk a lot about big data, but there is also more small data, small strategic in status data. Um, are you, are you thinking about it this way? Maybe I think of qualitative data as evidence. So when we first started, uh, allowing drivers to pay for their food, uh, when they're picking up a go food order, a lot of drivers ended up canceling and we had some hypotheses, but it was hard to track how much cash does a driver have on hand as a quantitative data point. And so instead we use qualitative. If a driver canceled an order, I was literally looking at the event logs. I would pull that driver ID. I would call them on the phone and say, sir or ma'am, why did you cancel this order? And then they would say, oh, I don't have enough money or I was just looking at the app or it was a misclick. But I would write all of these reasons down. And at about 30 surveys, you will generally get a theme that emerges. And you may get more precision in terms of the answers. But at 30, that's enough. And we were able to suss out that drivers don't have enough cash. That is a predominant reason that they are canceling. And so instead of asking drivers um, to... Instead of asking our engineers to build a feature that asks drivers how much cash they have on hand. Yeah, we'll first validate that this is a big enough problem based on the qualitative evidence. And then we can justify building that feature. I think that's one of the ways to kind of use qualitative evidence to inform product decisions. Very nice. Yeah. And it's a good reminder that uh, even at a large scale, going, uh, you know, one by one, talking yes. with people and then trying to, you know, Backward engineer that into some statistics. It's, it's just a very nice way to, to get some it insight. Is. It's underrated. Awesome. We're at the end. Thank you so much, Crystal, for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. Take care. Uh, if people want to follow you, where should they go? They should go to my Twitter at, I believe, Chris CW, uh, but I'm also at crystalwajaya.com. Awesome. I'll make sure I point to that. Thank you so much, Crystal. Have a good one. See you later. Bye. Thank you for listening to the June podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and subscribe. This episode is powered by June. For a better way to do product analytics, visit june.so.